Well, good afternoon, Jeff. Um, why don't we begin by you telling us a bit about your background in public transportation and um, about the Metropolitan Transit. Sure. So I am closing in on uh, 38 years in public transportation. 25 years uh, were spent with Houston Metro, so that was where I was kind of raised up. Uh, there was a lot of mobility in Houston Metro because I, I joined when they were like a year old, and so I came in as a civil engineer and designed parking lots, uh, but then became a service planner, went to office management budget, uh, took over transportation, and uh, left as a chief operating officer. So a very broad range of um, kinds of jobs, which is a really great opportunity and one that's not all that common. Uh, I worked under excellent people, including, I think, two people I consider legends in the industry, Alan Keeper and Shirley Delibero. Mm -hmm. um, I left TTI, I'm sorry, I left and went to TTI for five years. TTI is Texas A&M Transportation Institute, a, a great research institute, and we were serving as a staff extension for TxDOT, uh, helping provide technical support to about 70 small urban and rural providers. And an opportunity came up in, in San Antonio. Keith Parker was the CEO, uh, another legend, I guess you'd say. And um, he was looking for a deputy CEO uh, and uh, chose me. He left VIA only about six months later. Uh, and then the board made me interim and then and then, if you will, permanent, as permanent anything is, CEO. Uh, I've been in the CEO spot for about six years. Uh, and we are, are, VIA is an MTA in the state of Texas. That means we're funded through an MTA sales tax. Uh, unfortunately, we, uh, back in the 70s, locally decided to only pursue one half of the one cent that was authorized. And so we have a one cent, half cent sales tax. Um, the later transit authorities that came on, Austin, Dallas, and Houston, the big ones, all went for the full one cent. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, we operate about 470 buses. We operate a portion of the ADA paratransit system. It's unusual that part of it is operated by a contractor and part of it is operated in-house. Uh, but we're very proud of much of the progress we've made, uh, offering free Wi-Fi for now three years on all our buses, uh, installed 1,000 transit shelters over a three-year period, um, you know, obviously we've come up with a phone app. Uh, I think we're going to have some other really good technology projects coming on board shortly. Uh, we've put in what I would call bus rapid transit light that we call Primo, uh, and we're about to complete our third corridor there. So a lot of progress being made. Well, thank you for that um, briefing. And let's turn to our main subject today, which is the external relations role of the CEO is what you might call the connector in chief. Obviously very important in, in today's world. And I know one of your preeminent stakeholders, if you will, is the city of San Antonio. Tell us about that relationship and how it's developed uh, between VIA and the city and particularly the role you played as chief connector as CEO sure. of VIA. So, yeah, first of all, just to make, make sure everyone is clear, VIA is not a department of the city. Uh, VIA has an independent board, you know, a portion of which are appointed mm -hmm. by the city, a portion the county, a portion the suburban cities. Uh, so we are an independent agency. We don't receive um, automatically, at least, we don't receive funding from any of those entities. Uh, San Antonio is a very community-based city. Uh, I always say that here where, where we reside at what we call Via Via, I am in a um, 1907 train station, um, and across the street we have a 2015 Central Plaza that is extremely modern, and I think that's really symbolic of what this city is, really, you know, embraces and protects the heritage, but moves forward, um, you know, in, a, in an aggressive way. Um, in this community, it's important that, that you become part of the fabric of the community. 
Uh, and so I serve on a number of boards that have given me exposure to elected officials, appointed officials, et cetera. So specifically with the city, you know, we make a, a couple special efforts. Uh, one is, I think as most of us know, if you go to an elected f official for the first time, when you need something, you know, um, it's not the best circumstance. And so we try to build the relationship during a time in which we're not necessarily asking for anything. Um, and one of the ways we do that is we offer each of the, the councilmen and the county commissioners the opportunity to do a showcase of their district. And we will come out, typically it's done on a Saturday morning. They bring in a lot of the presidents from homeowners associations, et cetera, They're, a lot of their stakeholders. Uh, we get about a half an hour at the front end to tell the VIA story. And then we put them all on a bus and the councilmen and VIA will tour them in their district. We'll point out some of our features. Council, council person will point out their features. And it's a really great way right. to build a relationship. Now, may and, I interject a question? Sure, absolutely. You said you were on um, several boards. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, what percentage of your time, on the average, would you say you spend in the um, external relations arena? Um, or I, stakeholders? Mm, I would estimate between 20 and 25% of my time right. is spent, you know, I, I'm on a large number of boards. I'm an officer of the Visit San Antonio, which is the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, I also have served and cur currently serve on, you know, special assignments made by the mayor. So we're doing a climate ready uh, study and I'm on the steering committee for that. Southwest Transit Association, I'm the chair this year. Uh, so it's a variety. The chambers, I'm on several chambers, on committees with the chambers. Again, because you're building all those relationships and because you want VIA visible and at the table. So I would say, yeah, pretty, pretty confidently that I spend at least 20% of my week in these various kinds of venues. Okay. Now, back to the city. The other thing I just wanted to say about how we built the relationship, another thing we do to help build relationship with elected officials in the city specifically is when we hold our rodeo, um, and most systems have a bus rodeo, we have what we call the VIP rodeo element, which is conducted after we complete uh, the bus and van rodeo. And we invite elected officials and the media to participate in the VIP rodeo. The media, we, we often get good media coverage. Uh, and the elected officials, again, it's about relationship building. Now, I understand that you've um, been appropriated a uh, pretty uh, significant grant by the city. Uh, somewhere in the range of $10 million or so. Would you tell us about that? How did that happen? I'm sure it's relatively unusual around the country. But particularly for uh, the MTA, but most of the time the money goes the other direction from the MTAs okay. to the city for, for various purposes. So, so yes, I think it's probably pretty uh, unusual. So, you know, I'll, I'll go back to that bus rodeo. So, in fact, last year's VIP champion was a councilman, Ray Saldana, and we actually, I think, did our first showcase with him about three years ago. So he w became interested in VIA and its role with with his constituents, and they all encouraged him, uh, give it a try, and you'll see, you know, what the system is like, and you'll see the issues we face in using public transportation. So he gave up his car for a, for a full month and made all his trips by bus Whoa. and sat down with me afterwards and said, this is my observation. You know, your buses are very clean, never had a breakdown, operators are friendly, but your service is very infrequent. So if I had to make a, a transfer connection and I just missed it, that would really add probably more time than when I was in the vehicle. And so what can we do to increase the frequency of your service? Uh, and that start, that began a dialogue about, you know, well, we have the one half cent. So I always use the peanut butter analogy. You know, half cent buys a lot less peanut butter than a full cent. Uh, we have the same size service area as Houston. They have a full scent. They have more peanut butter on their bread. Peanut butter means frequency in this case. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so he said, well, then maybe we can find a way that the city can help find funding to help you increase frequency. That started a process. There was a, a briefing of council. They created a citizen, citizens committee. The citizens committee said they were looking at a specific funding source. They said, well, we think we can recommend to the city that you get $10 million from that funding source. What would you do? We'd like to have a very specific plan on what you would do with that $10 million. Now, how did you work with the Citizens Committee? Uh, yeah, uh, the Citizens Committee was chaired by two council members. One was Councilman Saldana, and there was a second councilman. They selected the citizens that were on the committee. Uh, and then they held, for, we, there were formal meetings. I believe they were open to the public. Uh, in which we, we talked them through our funding, we talked them through our service, the councilman shared his experiences, and then this committee sat around and looked at fu possible funding sources, identified what they thought would be good, how much was in that, how much might be available, how much might be car we could carve out, and then they said to us, uh, as I said, $10 million is what we think we could provide, what would you do with it? Uh, hey. So we, pre we pre prepared a very specific plan because, because we knew council support would, re would rely upon having a specific plan. You know, we dealt with, we talked to a number of council, council members while we were in the midst of this process, you know, and the overwhelming sentiment was, we understand that you're underfunded. We know you need more funds in order to provide a good, good system, a, a, a system that offers the kind of frequency that would be attractive. Uh, but we're not going to just give you any amount of money and just say, so go to it. We're going to want to know, you know, exactly how that money is going to be spent, which I re respect. So we prepared a plan, and the plan uh, attacked, if you will, the frequency issue on both ends. The half of the plan was focused on, in fact, as far as numbers of routes. It was really, from a dollar perspective, a smaller portion. Focused on routes that operated every hour because hourly service is just kind of there, but it's not attractive to anyone. And, and if a person is transit dependent, uh, they are likely, I think transit dependent is the wrong term, I'd say reliant, because they don't have to depend on transit in many cases. They can find other, other transportation. They can um, not make the trip if it's so inconvenient. So we wanted to take 60-minute service and reduce it to 30 minutes. At the other end of the spectrum, we were looking at routes that were uh, relatively frequent, and we wanted to push them to that 10 to 12 minute frequency that I call the sweet spot, where you don't need a schedule anymore. It's frequent enough that you just go out and wait for the bus. So about half of the routes that we touched in this plan were moving from a 20 minute to, let's say, a 10 to 12 minute frequency. So we worked both ends of that equation. Ultimately, came back to council a couple times through, and uh, last year, as part of their budget, they approved the plan, which was to be implemented in three phases. The first year, it's like I'm under five million because we're you know we're only implementing pieces of the plan. Uh, by next year, we'll be into the steady ten million dollars worth of service. So, how has it gone thus far? So, this is the you know we. We put in the first of the improvements in January. We did all of the 60 minute to 30 minutes, and then we started doing the uh, pushing service to the sweet spot. Um, and in January and February, we had unusually cold weather, especially for San Antonio. We had at least one day that the mayor asked people not to go out because of the threat of ice. So I was very concerned that that would be the first quarter and what kind of results might we, might we see. Uh, but we were surprised, actually, I, I'm really surprised at the fact that we had a pretty strong reaction to the increases in frequency. So if we look at our most recent numbers, uh, the month of May, and we look at that, those first set of routes, uh, those routes are up 14, about 14.5% 14 compared to the, the ridership level uh, same time a year ago, and compared to the rest of the system, when you segment out the rest of the system, it's been it's down about five percent. So you see, you got almost a twenty point spread there. 
uh, and, and it then made a big difference then. it made a big difference and then if you look at the routes that were implemented in the second phase which was may so these are routes that were changed in may and may was the first month of the change and uh, so we were measuring the effect those routes actually increased 16 and a half percent so combined we have very strong results which you know just I, I think verify what I say, you know, if, if real estate is location, 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 much of transit is frequency, frequency, frequency. Mm. And um, I think the city council, the mayor are both surprised at the quick response and the magnitude of the response, uh, and they can see the impact of their investments. And that's what you always want, right? <laughs> to have an impactful investment. So this um, this appropriation I assume is reappropriated in every budget or how does that work that's correct we have an agreement that talks in terms of to maintain the service will require the 10 million dollar year investment but the city has to reappropriate the money uh, every year so they're okay. in their budget cycle now we've had some council persons who said I think based upon this tremendous results have said well you know what about 10 million more <laughs> and so we I mean we're talking about other things we might That's do a good question, isn't it? it's, a, it's a good question to have um, you know certainly I want to get the first 10 million you know in, uh, out there and have that there mm -hmm. but it's really exciting that that the city is looking at us and saying you know we see the value uh, and we see that our investment has really paid off and so we're interested in at least talking about further investment. Great. Well, that's quite a, quite a uh, positive story, Jeff. Um, I've got a question we, um, we hadn't talked about, but mm -hmm. I think it would be great for our listeners. Mm -hmm. um, you are obviously a connector in chief par excellence. You, spend a lot of time in the external arena. Uh, we, uh, in one very important relationship, you've had a, a big return on your investment of time and energy with the city of San Antonio. If you were counseling um, CEO aspirant executives in the transportation field who uh, aspire to be chief executives like you, um, what would you say to them about the factors that would help them succeed in the external arena in playing this chief connector role? Sure. What would your advice be? Uh, my first thing I would say to them is that the CEO kind of has a unique uh, position there. And, you know, I said I've been 38 years in transit, and I will say that as I move through various jobs, the, the, the technical issues might change, but the skill sets were very similar. The kinds of things you had to do were similar. Yes, you had to work sometimes with outside agencies and often had to work with people inside your organization and convince them. When you become CEO, there's a complete change in, you know, orientation because now what you're doing, I believe, is establishing that, you know, what I'm doing, at least, is establishing that VIA is an important thread in the fabric of the, of the community. And if that thread is not there, then the fabric is not as strong. Um, and so if you want to be a CEO under those circumstances, first of all, you have to recognize that you're going to have to delegate away a lot of the things that you're more comfortable doing based upon, you know, your upbringing. At least I've had to. You know, I had a lot of upbringing. Operational. Right, yes, because yeah. uh, I had a lot of, of operational background, and so I was very comfortable uh, when people would come in with the monkey on their back, um, feeding the monkey, unfortunately, to some extent. <laughs> so I had to say, no, I cannot do that. Uh, I have to rely upon, I have a wonderful deputy CEO, uh, I have great vice presidents, and so rely on those, those people to give me the opportunity. The other thing I'll say is um, if you're bored, doesn't recognize how important that is. I think there'll be a, a, a value to helping the board understand that. I will say, though, that boards typically are, are big in community events and, and members of the community. So 
it's more likely that they're going to look at you and say, we need you out there more, right, than that you're going to have to convince them. And my board, from the beginning, said you know, that's a very important aspect in San Antonio. You want to succeed, you need to do that. And then I think you need to also think in terms of, um, you know, contributing to the, the community in that way. In other words, not just sitting on a board so that you're there and you're hearing, but being active uh, because that's where you really get to meet the people when you're doing committee work, you're doing project work. And I also think the whole idea of establishing a relationship, especially with elected officials outside of the cycle of need, is important because when you come back to them and at some point and say, this is what we need help with, or they come to you with a constituency issue, you have some basis of that relationship to help you. Yeah, you're saying it can't be one-sided. Give me, give me. No. Give me. <laughs> There's not, you know, I, and I'm, I, elected officials, I've heard them say it. They, you know, there are some people we only see when they're there to ask us for something. And, and you know, that's, that's not the way to do it. Well, Jeff, as you look forward and you think about this role, this key role of yours as the chief external officer along with your board chair and others on the board, but as the chief connector, how do you see that role evolving? Have you given much thought to that uh, as you look forward? I personally, because of the specific circumstances here at VIA, um, and that is that we have a long range plan, but our half cent doesn't fund much of any of it. We, we know that we are going to be needing to build relationships throughout this community, A, to get support for that plan, and B, to identify opportunities for funding, and probably C, uh, to generate the public support for whatever funding option, because most of the funding options that are at hand require voter, voter approval. So frankly, I think that, that this piece of the role is going to become stronger and need to become stronger uh, as we try to move forward with the city and the county and the suburban cities and TxDOT, all of those folks, the MPO, all of those folks as we try to move forward a, a program that is for the city of San Antonio, uh, something novel, something unique, but uh, is also not funded. So 20 30% could grow up into 40 or 50%. Yeah, it could, absolutely. And again... And you know, it's interesting. I'm sure you're well aware that uh, the average uh, for-profit corporate CEO probably does spend close to 50% of his or her time in right. the external right. world. Dealing with key stakeholders and so you see your role becoming even more external. Yes, I do. And, and frankly, I think that model, I mean, if, if, if I look at where I am today, I am in a similar situation to a nonprofit that is out there trying to, to develop and identify partners and identify funding. So it's not that different, bec again, because of the specific circumstances that we have here at VIA. Well, sir, I really appreciate you taking time from what I well know is a very demanding schedule to bring us up to date on your uh, work in the external arena and specifically the very productive relationship VIA has built uh, with the city of San Antonio. We'll have to do a part two somewhere uh, down the pike and have you uh, bring us up to date. But meanwhile, thanks a lot. Sure. And, hey, uh, I have one other piece of advice. Yes, sir. One yes, sir. other piece of advice, which I think everybody knows, but I need to put on the table. If you are going to be a connector in chief and you're going to spend 20, 25, 40% of your time outside, you need to have really strong people that are working uh, for you. And, you know, that's, for me, I, I feel blessed because if I didn't have the have really strong people working for me, I would not have the opportunity to spend all this time uh, in that function. So while I, I know everybody knows you want to have strong people, 
if you're going to be a connector in chief at that level, they need to be really strong. That's an excellent point, and I'm glad you shared that. Um, and a question occurs to me in closing, and you'll be happy to know your day will soon get better, and you'll, <laughs> you'll get rid of me here, but was it emotionally pretty difficult for you to disengage from operations and as you developed your external role? Was <laughs> it a kind of excruciating thing, or did it come simply? How, how did it work? Uh, I would put it in somewhere between simply and excruciating. Uh, I, you know, my background, I have an engineering degree, so problem solving is very comfortable to me, very enjoyable to me. So it was always easy for me to, when somebody had a problem, to talk through the problem with them and for us to work toward a solution. Um, and so to keep that kind of internal internal emphasis was a, a very comfortable spot, and a spot that I'd had for 30 years, right? right. However... However, uh, I found that as, you know, I uh, began building these relationships and serving on these committees and these boards, I mean, for me personally, it was uh, so enjoyable that uh -huh. that helped me because I understood that while I enjoyed and always done the problem solving, that I had people that were doing that for the most part for me now and that I could grow in another dimension. And it was a dimension that I just really happened to enjoy. So that was very fortunate, right? Well, very much so. Of course, yeah. not everyone would, would uh, be as comfortable in, in a radically different new role. And I suppose part of your message is be prepared to go through a little bit of pain. If you Absolutely. Move from being a senior executive to Absolutely. CEO and chief connector, um, be willing to go out of your comfort, get out of your comfort zone. Yes, you have to really be ready to, to work in a completely different way. That, in my case, thirty years of prior experience, you know, were of value. But I was going to have to do things that I had not really participated greatly in before, and. I very much enjoyed it, really enjoy it. I think I'm in a place now uh, where, you know, the, having the operation in, in, largely in the hands of others I'm comfortable with. We have great, like I said, great people who work for me, who work with me, bring me in when I should be brought in. So it's it's a, I mean, this is a, a such a great environment, a great city. Uh, love the agency. I don't know what more I can say about that. <laughs> well, this has been a great uh story, uh, Jeff. I appreciate you sharing it, and uh, we'll have to come back with a part two somewhere down the pike. Absolutely. Meanwhile, thanks again, and have a uh, great afternoon.